Okay, I want to put in a plug also for next time. I guess you can't come, Reese, because we're doing, uh, you know, uh, the myth of persecution, Christian persecution. And this is really a wonderful new topic. Candida Moss has done incredible work, and now there is a scholar, uh, a historian with really no real anti-Christian bias, and he's just... He's come over to our side. He believes that at least the Huronian persecution in 64, 67 AD, somewhere in there, uh, it, it didn't happen, he doesn't think, or at least not to that extent. But this, is a, this is a real game changer. So I'll, I'll, you know, I'll read you more about it because this is very exciting. It was in the New York Review of Books, and it, it is really something. I mean, when the, when, the, when the mainline historians are coming over to this idea. And what was the Were book? they feeding lions to in the Con, Well, this, or Condita whatever? Moss is the one that, she's not, you know, she's really got good creds, too. She's written the thing on the myths of persecution. She started studying, um, you know, the Christian martyrs and how they were trying to imitate, you know, the imitation of Christ and what have you. And I think the deeper she got into it, the more she realized that, you know, it didn't exist to the extent that the Christians were claiming. And she comes out of, you know, theology faculty and everything. So you're so saying she, she has, wrote a good book? Oh, it's a wonderful book. What is the book? Oh, Jesus, I oh, don't sorry. have the title. That's where I got okay. messed up. Just if you oh, look her up, Candida Moss, you'll have the title immediately. And, of course, it's in my bib. If you look on atheistscholar.org. She's a wonderful person, and just, it's just great. Okay, so, um, you know, although I'm a retired and rare out-of-print bookseller, I want to tell you, so you don't think I'm crazy when I'm trying to talk to you about postmodernism, that I worked with and studied with George Chiss at Lines at the DFT. It was a fabulous program. He brought famous poets like Allen Ginsberg for readings. We studied literature, criticism, film, culture, so on. George even allowed me. I was very honored to teach some classes, although I was not on the faculty. I have um, read my published poetry at the Wayne State Colloquium Series in the Detroit Public Library, and I taught English at Wayne State. So um, I know an awful lot about <laughs> English criticism, and a lot of it's bullshit, okay? So at Lines, we study POMO, uh, that's postmodernism, and deconstruction. Um, I can assure you they can be very confusing, so I'm just going to be giving you the tip of the iceberg tonight, okay? What's our topic? Uh, Postmodernism. Postmodernism. Tonight. Yeah. So please hang in. Get a quick trip through the past. It's important to take any school of criticism not too seriously. <laughs> There's been a plethora of schools since uh, the discredited deconstructionists, um, evolutionary cr uh, criticism, queer theory, historical, and so on. Uh, none of them is a complete answer, and all sooner or later go out of style. And now the big thing, as we were just talking about it with Norm before you guys came, is the Anthropocene, which is humans affecting climate and culture and everything. And, and, and now we are no longer separate from nature, which we weren't, but anyway. <laughs> so it's a scientific thing that's in dispute, but the cultural people and the English critics have picked it up we were just saying chance to write papers, you know, maybe get published and what have you. And wonderful, wonderful, wonderful titles from, from the cultural people. Learning to Die in the Anthropocene, <laughs> Love in the Anthropocene, Molecular Red Theory of the Anthropocene, and The Mushroom at the End of the World on the Possibility of Life in Capitalist um, Ruins. <laughs> I don't know why they keep saying that capitalism is a ruins because it is not, but anyway. Okay, so it that's a big thing. So Pomo is now out, but I think it's important for several reasons and see what you think. But don't forget Anthropocene because that's that's the latest new thing. Okay. The books and articles mentioned during the lecture may be found at the end of this written lecture in the bibliography at atheistscholar.org. There have been requests from atheists for a lecture on postmodernism, and it is a relevant topic for several reasons. Postmodernism dominated much of the theoretical discourse in both academe and intellectual circles from the mid-1970s until about the mid-1990s. 
From that fact alone, anyone with an interest in the humanities, especially philosophy, will find it important to learn something about the school of thought which once commanded such attention and hegemony in many of the most consequential universities, particularly in France and the United States. It is also important for non-believers to understand why, since postmodernism's thought process involved rejecting meta-narratives, there was still a small crack in its stance that allowed for the acceptance of religion, even perhaps the acceptance of a transcendent other. The flexible attitude to religion was not matched by postmodernism's attack on what some of its practitioners called the meta-narrative of science. This lecture will discuss postmodernism's emergence from a rejection of two important areas of thought, modernism and structuralism. Along with modernism, postmodernists thoroughly eschewed its precursor, the 18th century European Enlightenment and its humanist project. We shall also glance at the second philosophy rejected by postmodernism, that of structuralism, and structuralism's origin from semiotics. Semiotics is just signs and symbols and how they're used in, in language. <clears throat> we shall learn how postmodernism, engaging in an extended critique of both theories, evolved into a theory-driven discipline of its own, and what those tenets were vis-a-vis -vis modernism and structuralism. Then we shall glance at some of the ideas of several of the most important proponents of postmodernism, Foucault, Derrida, Lyotard, Deleuze and Guattari, Baudrillard, as well as the strange case of the deconstructionist professor, Paul Demont. Then I plan to engage in a critique of postmodernism, including some details of a famous intellectual spoof committed on it by one of its most tenacious opponents. We shall conclude with a brief affirmation of the life stance embraced by most of the secular community, humanism. <clears throat> the roots of structuralism lay in the semiotic theory of Ferdinand de Saussure, 1857 to 1913. Saussure pondered language and concluded that its vital component was the sign. He stated that the sign consisted of one, an audio-visual component that he called the signifier, say cat, in other words, the word, and a conceptual component, the signify, which is our idea of what a cat is. They've kind of been dropping it lately, but then there's also a referent out there which are real cats, okay? <laughs> okay. Uh, Saussure believed language could be studied as a system of signs, as he maintained, that express ideas or signify concepts that through differing signs express meaning. He believed that the present laws of operation were all that were needed to understand language, rather than language as history. Saussure came up with two important ideas. The first was that the linguistic sign was an arbitrary cultural designation, that there was no natural link between signifier and signified. His second realization was that the sign cat operated by its different from, difference from other signs like mat, rat, sat, and so on. He concluded, therefore, that in language, there are only differences without positive terms. And by the way, uh, an American uh, who, who really was the forerunner of the pragmatist school, Charles Peirce, he also came up with a very similar theory. From the concept of semiotics came the practice of structuralism. Best and Kellner state that structural analysis focused on the underlying rules which organized phenomena into a social system analyzing such things as totemic practices in terms of divisions between the sacred and profane in traditional societies or cuisines in modern societies in terms of their culinary rules. This, these are just examples. The structuralists believe that the structures or systems of thought such as psychoanalysis, anthropology, mythology, kinship systems, and so on were governed by unconscious codes or rules and that such codes were the underpinning of each thought system. Here is Roland Barthes' explanation. The aim of all structuralist activity in fields of both thought and poetry is to reconstitute an object and by this process to make known the rules of functioning or functions of this object. Structuralists believe that in this manner the invisible framework of the various systems of thought would emerge or be brought out. So they analyzed the rules that made up the organization of such things as totemic practices, cuisine, psychology, and so on. One can discern that structuralism was a rejection of humanism, 
The stance that had previously been all important in the social and human scientists. sciences. For a discussion of humanism and its tenets, please see Atheist Philosophy Humanism at atheistscholar.org. Structuralist aims were objectivity, coherence, rigor, truth, and states Kellner. It claimed scientific status for its theories. Its practitioners wanted to purge theory from its subjective valuations. The subject or person or human was dismissed or decentered because the self and the subject were seen to be constituted by their dependence on language. Because of this dependence, it was understood that the self and the subject were linguistic and social constructs. Kellner explains, the parola, or particular uses of language by individual subjects, was determined by Lang, the system of language itself. The self had no existence outside of social and linguistic constructions of it. And by the way, the Anthropocene group now is bringing back the construction of the self, a lot of novelists. <laughs> so, before I move on to modernism and postmodernism's rejection of it, I would like to speak for a few moments about Jacques Lacan, 1901 to 1981, an important French neo-Freudian whose psychoanalytic theory was based on structuralism. His famous essay, and this is quite a famous essay, The Mirror Stage <clears throat> as Formative of the Function of the Eye, 1949, describes how we attain a false sense of self-identity by our identification with images and reflections. Lacan stated that around six months to 18 months old, the child sees its own behavior and self-reflected in other older children, adults, and mirrors. At that stage, the child is uncoordinated but when seeing itself outside of itself, it misrecognizes itself as fully coordinated and or soon to be unified. Lacan believed that it was during this stage that the ego was formed. He explained that our sense of self is bound up with exterior images, not from within. He believed that we have alienation and division built into our images all our lives. Lacan stated that we are in a constant, and futile state of desire for some mythical inner unity and stability that will give us a sense of being whole. That, that sense of wholeness, he explained, was never true, and people <clears throat> should abandon the search for the illusion of wholeness. His theories were consequential for both structuralism and postmodernism. Modernism was another dominant practice before postmodernism displaced it. Many of its ideals came from the European 17th and 18th century enlightenment. Modernism placed emphasis on arriving at absolute knowledge in science, technology, society, and politics, or at the very least, it cherished the certainty that absolute knowledge could eventually be attained. Additionally, modernism was associated with belief in progress, optimism, and rationality. Such values are often considered enlightenment ideals. Please see an atheist perspective on the Enlightenment at AtheistScholar.org. The concepts of progress, optimism, and rationality are considered foundational for the age of reason, or the Enlightenment, and were a significant influence on Western thought. Western thinkers are still debating and coming to terms with modernism's ideals, from our concepts of art, architecture, literature, and music, to the philosophic questions about the nature of man and the debate over the most suitable form of government. Modernism's tenets are consequential when we examine, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> examine our belief in forms of ethics and morality and our choices between them. Enlightenment ideals are the bedrock of Western thought. The firm belief in progress was upheld by the trust that gradual perfection would come about by people increasing in self-knowledge and by the adoption of a rigorous intellectual method. Kant, Voltaire, and Hegel each subscribed to such thinking. As Glenn Ward maintains, the denouement to such concepts was an investment in universal human rights that ultimately led up to the French Revolution and the United States Declaration of Human Rights. But there was a downside to such a glorification of Western man. Western thinkers became so sure that Western values were superior that Europe began to be considered the most civilized and enlightened part of the world. Such notions of superiority led to the more noxious ambition to be to better exploit or colonize cultures considered inferior. The backlash from such beliefs and actions they gave rise to is being felt with a vengeance in the West in the present day 
from terrorism by those who believed they were exploited to issues of immigration and assimilation of large numbers of people from what are considered inferior cultures. Postmodernism wanted to shake off the shackles of the Enlightenment project. Mistake. <laughs> its proponents did not believe in a rationalist, progressive future for mankind. They pointed out that the Enlightenment's dark face was that of oppression. But postmodernists also claimed with justification that the Enlightenment had produced several disciplinary institutions such as prisons, madhouses, and large school systems. They accused it as well of creating discourses, vocabulary, and practices that legitimatized its domination and control over citizens. Despite such glaring errors, many important philosophers, such as the German thinker Habermas, continue to invest in the belief that modernism has unfulfilled potential, and he argues further that it has the resources to overcome its limitations <coughs> and destructive effects. <coughs> Postmodernists would have none of such defenses of modernism, rationality, and notions of progress. They held that new developments such as computers, information technology, and media were giving rise to new social formations. They believed that the spread of capitalist penetration and global homogenizing and new forms of knowledge demanded new concepts and theories. Postmodernists stated that those processes were giving rise to increased cultural fragmentation changes in the experience of space and time, and according to Ward, new modes of experience, subjectivity, and cultures. The criticism of postmodernism is concerned with its alleged exhaustion, pessimism, irrationality, and particularly its disillusionment with the idea of absolute knowledge. Postmodernism also rejects the concept of the undivided self. Most postmodernists did not embrace the notion of the self except as a vague, shifting consciousness constructed by the exigencies of language and cultural demands. We shall see what different theorists who address the issue of the self believed about the topic. I have already mentioned the word subject, and I shall be using it during this lecture. It simply means person or human being. Some postmodernists believe this, that the subject or the self was determined and incapable of emergence from cultural impact but others saw escapes from all the all-encompassing exigencies of capitalist society's domination. We shall glance at their thinking in a few moments. Postmodernism believed in fluidity, not only of the self, but of its philosophy as well. Against the high modernist value system, postmodernist art, writing and thinking, is replete with a new insouciance, playfulness, and eclecticism. Postmodernism excels in new forms, prestige, quotation, playing with past forms, irony, cynicism, commercialism, and, as we shall see, outspoken nihilism. Even though postmodernism engages in a significant cultural critique, it often coexists happily with the pluralism of styles and games, according to Douglas Kellner. It also tends toward populism, as opposed to modernism's elitism. Rejecting modernist highbrow and elitist art, postmodernism's writing and theory, as well as its art and music forms, attempted to do away with the old-fashioned narrative control of the author or thinker. Its project was to replace it with an exaggerated reader response, viewer response, or listener response. In music, this practice often resulted in almost no sound or disjointed sounds made with various substitutes for traditional instruments such as hammers and so on. <laughs> now, Norm. <laughs> There was a repetitive motif which can be heard in the music of the popular Philip Glass. Other postmodern composers were John Adams, William Bolcom, and Elliot Carter. The attempts were a break from, but in some way similar to the practices of high modernism. Postmodernism carried this revolution further, however. In writing, many postmodernists tried to break the narrative completely, using words that deliberately had no relation to each other. Its practitioners used strategies such as bricolage, polystylism, and randomness. Most postmodernists and their proponents have considered art, music, and literature as an attitude rather than one style. Here are some of its elements, as located by Jonathan Kramer in a discussion about postmodern mu music. It challenges barriers between high and low. Symphony orchestras now play with rock musicians, for example. Shows disdain for structural unity questions the exclusivity of elitist values, avoids totalizing forms, does not like a formal mold, and quotes from music, art, and literature of all ages and from all cultures. 
Additionally, it has multiple meanings and locates meanings in hearers and readers more in scores and narrative or performances or readings by composers, writers, and artists. I have included other arts along with music because I believe that Kramer's list of elements may be found in many aspects of postmodern art, literature, architecture, and film. There are other characteristics shared by postmodern art. Some of the most important are bricolage, using what is at hand, in other words, found objects, polystylism, using elements from many styles and eras, and randomness. Random will leave some element of the composition up to chance or a choice of the performers of the piece. In art, as I have mentioned, many of the same elements and methods are applied as in music. Performance art, art assemblages, and digital art installations are popular with postmodern artists. Conceptual art was central to the postmodern scene in the 1970s and was a deconstruction of a work of art. Barbara Kruger, she's one of my favorites, <laughs> Saul Lewitt, and Jenny Holtz are well-known practitioners of this style that often consists of an image and words or simply words such as born to shop and protect me from the things I want. <laughs> She's really quite good. Most of their work is critical of contemporary cultural constructs such as capitalism and questions received ideas both in the world of the arts and in the greater society. Literature of the postmodern era is also caught up with collage, pastiche, and broken narratives. Thomas Pynchon's novel, Gravity's Rainbow, 1973, Joseph Heller's Catch-22, 1961, and Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughter, Slaughterhouse-Five, 1969, are classical pieces of postmodernist literature. Postmodern writers were very much in tune with deconstruction theory and with reader response theories that prioritized readers' responses more than the writer's intent and authority. Here are just a few of the strategies employed by postmodern authors. Irony, paranoia, parodies of older styles, such as neatly wrapped up endings, black humor, time distortions, and rejection of realism. Gravity's Rainbow is considered the quintessential postmodern novel, but James Joyce's 1922 Ulysses, often cited as an example of high modernism, employed many of the same devices. They really, it really did, and it's a better book, I think. Such overlapping of literary styles demonstrates that the shift from one school to another is often blurred and indistinct. Postmodern film is similar to other postmodern genres with its emphasis on the pastiche of many styles, its self-reflexivity, which refers to other films and film styles rather than to an external <coughs> reality, and an undoing of the modernist and classical rules which disallowed mixing high and low. Some examples are Quentin Tarantino's 1994 Pulp Fiction, Ridley Scott's 1982 Blade Runner, and Christopher Nolan's 2000 Memento. A few other significant postmodern directors are Wes Anderson, Charlie Kaufman, the Coen brothers, and Jim Jarmusch. I have left postmodern architecture for last because almost everyone who has visited shopping malls built in the last 20 years has been exposed to this style. Glenmore delineates the elements that may be observed in a postmodern mall. There is a combination of architectural styles from past times with modern elements mixed with art deco, cinemas, theaters, and so on. There is a mix of nationality types with Italian pizzerias, American-type retro diners, and London pubs. There is play between different surfaces, materials and colors, marble effects, mirrors, plastic, wood, chrome, and unconcealed girders. There is a high degree of fake and a paucity of real material use. In place of the real, full marble and flagstone may be discerned, and if you tap a column, it is very likely it will be hollow. There is a large amount of referencing not only to styles of different times and places, but the exterior of the building might also echo the shapes and material of the surrounding area. Area. Postmodern architecture is a decided rejection of the early modernist style of architecture, which has earned criticism from both critics and the public. Many modernist housing projects designed by such consummate practitioners, such as Corbusier and Mies de Randero created public buildings for low-income families in the middle 1950s. A lot of you are probably, you know, acquainted with this. The tenants hated the buildings, which were spare and sterile, and frequently vandalized them. Modernist styles had been considered the hopeful future of urban planning, but it never occurred to anyone to consult those who had to live and work in such <laughs> structures. 
Postmodern buildings often have exaggerated curves and wavy lines breaking the old angular pattern of earlier eras. Some important architects of the style are Robert Venturi, Frank Gehry, and Charles Jenks. Since the arts were so imbued with postmodern thought, I thought it was necessary to glance at the philosophy's impact on them. But now I shall turn to a discussion of the most important subjects of this lecture, postmodernism's cultural and philosophic theories. Postmodern values dominated the critique of culture for a number of years. It had hegemony from the mid-1970s, arguably, until its decline in the mid-1990s. I shall be discussing postmodernist theory and pointing out its significant problems and lapses at some length. I would like to say at the outset, while I reject most postmodern theory, its practitioners' insights regarding cultural construction were some of the most sophisticated ideas of the last century. Those ideas remain in the moderate adaptations of them that have been adopted by many disciplines, and I am decidedly in favor of that adoption. The two most important aspects of postmodern culture and philosophy are its rejection of humanist enlightenment values and its definite, definitive repudiation of meta-narratives. Postmodern theorists declared that concepts like justice, law, truth, and especially science mm were nothing more than cultural constructions. Foucault, Derrida, Baudrillard, Lyotard, Deleuze, and Guattari were some of the most important philosophers of the theory, and we shall see how its tenets played out in their writings. I am unable in the time allotted for this lecture to discuss in depth the philosophy of each of these thinkers who were the giants of postmodernism. The talk will attempt to locate their ideas vis-a-vis -vis issues relevant to atheism. Please keep in mind that the theories of the postmodern thinkers were very complex and the language they adopted was poetic, jargon-ridden, and very difficult to understand. I have tried to simplify their thoughts so that we might gain some understanding of their insights and their errors. For more analysis of postmodernism and its theorists, please see the bibliography at the end of the written lecture at atheistscholar.org. The presentation I am providing will make clear the relationship of postmodern philosophy to science, rationality, and humanism, and explain why its tenets fail the secular community. Jacques Derrida, 1930-2004, was most interested in writing, reading, and the assumptions made about those disciplines. He stated that the belief that things are meaningful before we give words to them was a mistake. He called this error the metaphysics of presence. For example, he explained that we assume things exist outside the text, so we are led to ask what postmodernism is rather than what the word postmodernism does. <laughs> <laughs> Although postmodernism did not deny there was an external reality, thinkers like Derrida came dangerously close to denying there was anything the human mind could grasp that was outside the text. Words were the touchstone by which reality was grasped by humans, according to Derrida, and since meaning is always just out of reach, Definite conclusions about reality were difficult, perhaps impossible to reach. Texts are made up of words, and words refer to other words. Texts <laughs> refer to other texts, and there are many ways to approach and critique texts. Derrida believed that both speech and writing are texts that are characterized by difference or difference. If you look up a word in the dictionary, you are frequently led to more words, so meaning is always deferred. Words, he said, or signs contain traces of each other and really have no essential meaning of their own. Derrida's idea took fire in America and are known as deconstruction. This mode of criticism achieved hegemony in academe, particularly in the humanities, until about the mid-1990s. It is a very complex theory, but I will undertake a simplified version. Derrida believed all Western thought, including its text, was based on the concept of a center. Jim Powell states that some examples of centers are a truth center, an ideal form center, a fixed point center, and an immovable mover or God center. Centers exclude. The concept of Christianity and Christ was once at the center of Western culture, and other beliefs and non-beliefs were marginalized, ignored, or repressed. The same happens in male-dominated societies whose women are marginalized. Human longing for a center forms binary opposites, with the center marginalizing the opposite or the opposition. Centers have a tendency to become frozen, and binary opposites need free play to avoid ossification. 
Derrida pointed out the instability of text and of meaning. But if meaning is unstable, it can be discerned that humans who invented language and meaning are unstable too. A kind of schizophrenia afflicts postmodern society, according to Derrida. But this postmodern belief in human instability does not provide a firm foundation for political action or seeking social justice, and unfortunately does not suggest solutions to the dilemma. That is a major flaw of most of its thought. Derrida was arguably the most important proponent of deconstruction theory. But during the last 10 years of his life, one may observe in Derrida's work a tendency to affirm some sort of transcendent other. He was influenced by the ideas of Emmanuel Levinas, 1906 to 1995, who believed that the other is one's brother and who advocated the adoption of ethics in the face of uncertainty. Um, in Derrida's defense, even though he was preoccupied by religion, it was the negative kind so popular with contemporary theologians. Negative religion does not speak about God except to state that such a vast unknowable cannot be spoken of in comprehensible terms. This is going on in some of the most sophisticated theology schools in, in the country and all over the world, really. Western world, anyway. Postmodernism, with its denial of reality often lacks coherent critiquing of religion. Religious advocates deliberately misunderstanding Der Derrida's writing gloated that the philosopher who had abjured, abjured transcendent others had embraced religion. And that is such a bore, it's on the web a lot, it's very irritating and annoying. <laughs> <laughs> this brings the lecture to Gilles Deleuze, 1925 and 1995, and Felix Guitari. 1930 to 1992, who believed that Western culture is given up to what they called aborescence. This, the term is the concept of a tree-like structure with branches sprouting out from it. They thought that this dominant paradigm stemmed from Plato's notion of ideal forms, where the form of, say, an ideal dog, which existed somewhere not on earth, contained the essence of dogginess. The branches in such a concept of ideal form would consist of spaniels, collies, poodles, and so on. Instead of the tree concept that dominated Western culture, Deleuze and Guattari prescribed a free play of forms, interconnectedness, and unrestrained flowing back and forth called the rhizome. The rhizome has surface connections and lines of flight, in other words, no real end. <laughs> Both men thought that trying to repress or cure schizophrenia was a form of social control. They wrote extensively about capitalist, extensively about capitalist society's attempt to channel desire and to organize social codes such as consumerism, finance, the law, psychiatry, the nuclear family unit, social class, and conventional gender roles. They charged that capitalism was trying to control the free play of desire. But, they stated, capitalism subverts itself by releasing desire in many directions. <laughs> in order to keep consumerism active, it must invent new territories for desire. They argued that as commodities multiply, there are more things to desire, more images to identify with, and more lines of escape. Both Deleuze and Guattari believed that a kind of schizophrenic approach to living, a destabilized ebb and flow of being, was a way out of the deterministic strictures of Western society. They were two of the few postmodernists who did not believe that there was no longer any escape for the constructed self, made up of the strictures of capitalism, religion, and so on. They warned, however, that one must not allow oneself to fall into a schizophrenic condition or psychosis because then one's control is lost and the play of desire is blocked. The problem with their theory is that they were unable to provide any prescription for the type of life stance they were advocating. Critics have pointed out that the shattering of the self is experienced by many troubled people in the present day as a painful rather than as an exalted state. The tendency of many postmodern thinkers to romanticize the emotionally disturbed as subversive rather than troubled was sometimes taken to absurd lengths. Some of the prescriptions of postmodern thought can leave people who embrace them deprived of a solid foundation that helps them manage and control their lives. Postmodernism never came to terms with the fact that many people have difficulty functioning without social codes and structures. James M. Glass's Shattered Selves, 1996, is an excellent critique of Deleuze and Guattari's proposed mode of escape from the strictures of monolithic capitalism. The mo next most important theorist is Michel Foucault, 1926 to 1984, a personal favorite of mine. Mm -hmm. I love Michel. <laughs> 
He used the term discourse very frequently in his writing. Discourse, in the sense that Foucault used it, was the entire practice of an institution or discipline. So, let us imagine the prison system's discourse made up of three elements. These elements are the prison system's language use or particular vocabulary, the institution of the prison system itself, and finally the entire discipline together with the vocabulary and the institution. Discourses produce knowledge. In the case of prisons, the means and types of incarceration, who the criminals are, and what motivates them, and so on. Those who are in control of each discourse are the experts that determine what that knowledge is. So now, you know, we, we depend on analysts to say, you know, what this, you know, thing, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Educators, they, they determine what the knowledge is. This is not necessarily a good thing. The old expression, knowledge is power, has been given more depth with Foucault's examination. The production of knowledge is a very powerful tool. Those who control the discourse of each institution, universities, medical associations, mental health systems, also control the power to create the vocabularies and the definitions as well as the rules. The experts classify and decide. It is they who determine what are legitimate and illegitimate statements. They keep people in check, prevent so-called deviants from upsetting the norms of society, and regulate people to become useful members of society. Psychology is a particularly important discourse for both enforcing and deciding on what the norms of a society are. Foucault believed the idea of the subject or man was an invention, a construction that was invented around the time of the Renaissance. He stated that the idea, or rather the social construction of man, was dying out, and there might eventually come the emergence of another type of consciousness. Foucault's four-volume work on sex, History of Sexuality, 1980, to 1986 was intriguing and thoughtful. He dismissed the notion that sex was repressed in Western society. Rather, he pointed out how people in the West talk about sex incessantly. Psychology <laughs> talks about sex as do the patients of psychology. There are surveys released on sex, relentless media coverage and discussion of sex crimes, sexologists, promotion of safe sex, birth control and abstinence debates, abortion arguments and discussions, talk about sexual hang-ups, jokes, advice on looking and being perceived as sexy, and other incessant attention. He thought that the intense societal focus invents various categories of sexual formation and behavior and that sex is used as one more control. People, he argued, no longer enjoy their pleasure, and he did not believe such open attention signified healthy behavior. They are, people are now categorized into types and into problems. Sexual pleasures are now understood by how much they deviate from the norm, which despite changes in attitudes toward same-sex relationships, remains heterosexual sex. Foucault believed there was no one monolithic power, but micropowers like the system of mental health and other institutions that control discourse. He did not argue that the various forms of power ended in complete domination because he believed that where there is power, there is also resistance. He found there were places where people could resist. It is difficult to know how concrete resistance might take place because of Foucault's reluctance to locate more monolithic power points. But his work was some of the most interesting and practical among the postmodernists. Jean Baudrillard, 1929-2007, and by the way, his, his work influenced The Matrix, although he did absolutely disowned any connection to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm was one of postmodernism's most influential thinkers. It was he who discussed the idea, some of it borrowed from other thinkers, of the image or spectacle that now dominated the postmodern world and took the place of reality. Actually, this idea came from the situationists, but I didn't want to go into that. <laughs> um, okay, according to Jim Powell, Derrida claimed that signs and images no longer bear any relation to the real world but create their own hyper-reality, an order of representation that is not the unreal but that has replaced reality and is more than real. A good example is the Disneyland amusement parks. Baudrillard claimed that the parks are presented as imaginary and attempt to make people believe the rest of America is real. <laughs> <laughs> But he insisted it is not. It is pure simulacrum. A simulacrum bears no relation to reality at all. He called the present state of affairs 
the death of the real, and claimed that is why we've invented myths of origin. He also thought that Western societies take up show scandals, both political and sexual, in order to pretend such affronts are deviations from the norm and proof that our governments and citizens respect law, order, and morality. But he maintained that the so-called shocking scandals are fakes. Baudrillard believed life had become TV and media, and that TV and media had become life. <laughs> he thought that people had blended with television and media. He argued that was, what was previously a society had imploded into a hyper-conformist body, obsessed so much with spectacle that would rather watch TV than take political action. He thought that the citizenry of the Western world, which had been studied, pulled, tested, and hyped by media and sociology, had become passive and bored. He stated that it was not only passive and resistant, but more demanding of extreme events, such as more moonshots, rock spectaculars, and mass entertainment of all sorts. But at the same time, the public was skeptical and suspicious. He thought it was quite possible that the citizenry had realized that any attempt to change the system would be co-opted by the system for its own ends. He maintained that Americans had become particularly afflicted with this insidious passivity. Baudrillard's interesting but deterministic view <clears throat> finally came to a close, came close to a sort of fashionable nihilism. His tongue-in-cheek pronouncements, such as the title of his 1991 book, The Gulf War Did Not Take Place, <laughs> outraged many people. He never meant to deny that the death and destruction of that war ever happened, but instead he was attempting to point out that it had become a media spectacle. However, his superior attitude seemed to ignore the real tragedy and suffering of the people who were bombed and killed and others who were displaced. There appears to be very little room in his thought concerning those people in the world who are under, underprivileged, displaced, and in pain. There is never anything unreal about human suffering. Jean-Francois Lyotard, 1924-1928, was a thinker who became internationally famous for his seminal 1979 volume, The Postmodern Condition, a report on knowledge. Quebec, Canada's government commissioned it, and the book surveyed the state of technology and science, both its present and its future. Lyotard made many intelligent predictions about a future given over to technology, when effort information would not depend on people but on computers. He stated that people, businesses, and governments would try to steal information, and of course that's happening, and high prices would be paid for it. He thought governments might go to war to obtain it. But ultimately, the book turned to science, specifically how science and the scientific method legitimize themselves. Lyotard argued that science is different from other narratives because science statements must prove themselves, unlike, say, mythology, legend, and philosophy. The principle of proving scientific statements has been known as the law of verification and in the 20th century, the rule of falsification. But Lyotard argued that science is unable to legitimize itself. In other words, it cannot answer why society should find it necessary. I find this so absurd or even why there should be scientific activity at all. <laughs> so, Lyotard concluded, science turned a narrative relying on the narrative of the European Enlightenment and on the, on the German meta-narrative of striving for the one great knowledge. Both narratives were supposed to be contributions to the freedom and well-being of people. Lyotard maintained that science unfortunately came up with paradoxes such as the quantum vagaries of the electron. Science, he said, could no longer play the savior of the human race, so it fell back on touting its performativity, which was discovering what kind of research works best. Lyotard argued that after World War II, which ended in 1945, people no longer believed in the two meta-narratives of the Enlightenment and the notion of one complete knowledge. In fact, he maintained that now they believe in micro-narratives. No micro-narrative is able to dominate the rest or explain the rest. Lyotard readily admitted that his theory was a mega-narrative of its own. However, some of his thinking had egregious results. The religious fundamentalists of the present day use Lyotard's work, along with similar postmodern statements, to maintain that the evolutionary theory of Darwin is merely a scientific narrative. They embrace the notion that evolution does not have superior validity over creationism. And you guys have all heard that argument a million times. This is really dangerous ideas. Please see Evolution versus Creationism and Intelligent Design at atheistscholar.org for an extended discussion of creationist attempts 
to have their pseudo-theory recognized as equal to evolutionary theory. Their goal is to have creationism taught in the United States public school system. Thinkers like Leotard are partially responsible for this unfortunate state of affairs. The children of America need scientific knowledge desperately if the United States is to continue to maintain its hegemony in the world. Science has a narrative to be sure, but it's a narrative that corrects itself when faced with undeniable facts. It is always in process rather than stasis. Light Leotard had a biased and incorrect understanding of what science does and how it proceeds. I shall be discussing postmodernism's reprehensible stance against science later in the lecture. One of the last of the most important postmodern thinkers was the literary theorist and professor Paul DeMond. This is a scandal. 1919 and 1983. He was employed by several different and prestigious American universities during the course of his career and had a solid reputation as a formidable deconstructionist. He, J. Hillis Miller, and Jacques Derrida were the most vocal, the most respected, and the most feared proponents of the theory of deconstruction. I am going to quote Lois Louis Vinant's musings about literature and theory extensively because I think it will help us gain an understanding of why the scandal surrounding the late Demont was so demoralizing to those disciplines. This is Menand. To think about literature is to think theoretically. If you believe that literature is different from other kinds of writing, if you have ideas about what's relevant and what isn't for understanding it, like which class had ownership of the means of production and whether or not some literature gives you goosebumps, and if you have standards judging whether it's great or not so great, say a pleasing style or a displeasing politics, then you have a theory of literature. You can't make sense of it without one. It's the job of people in literature departments to think about these questions, to debate them, and so disseminate their views. This is not arid intellectualism. It affects the way students <coughs> will respond to literature the rest of their lives. But it's also part of the inquiry into the role of art in human life. <coughs> The effort to figure out why we make this stuff, what it means, and why we care so much about it. If this is not the most important thing in the world to understand, it is certainly not the least. Unquote. I believe that Manan's statement is true with regard to all the arts and to philosophy as well as literature. The literary theory went through a severe crisis about 25 years ago, and while it surely would have occurred to Dr. Paul de Mont, he became the notorious symbol of what people disliked or feared about deconstruction theory. For those who are interested in the full description of the Paul de Mont scandal, please see Evelyn Barish's biography, The Double Life of Paul de Mont 2013, which, while it was containing some historical errors, is an excellent examination of his life and misdeeds. The proponents of deconstruction presided over literature departments, particularly in France and the United States, because these professors were considered to be the top thinkers in their profession. The New York Times covered their books and lectures, as did other important publications. Their books and papers were extensively reviewed, as deconstruction was considered an essential part of postmodernism. The deconstructionists gained, gained a great deal of attention because new claims were being made, not just about language and philosophy, but as we have seen, about knowledge itself. Paul Demont, 1919 to 1983, arrived in the United States in 1948 from Belgium. He gave the impression and was assumed by those who knew him that he had suffered many reversals in Belgium because he had, begun, had been against the Nazi regime during World War II. Nothing could have been further mm. from the truth. Hmm. Three years after Demont's death, a Belgian graduate student poking in that nation's archives found some early work by Demont. This discovery not only proved that Demont had written some 200 articles for important newspapers controlled by the Nazis, such as La Soir, but also re believe, re revealed that he was a decided fascist. I read some of those papers, and they are really disgusting. I'm sure he was smart enough to... Boy, wasn't he. He had praised the Nazis, savvy Jewish intellectuals, and triumphantly declared there was a new order in Europe. The student informed former students of Paul Dema, and the story quickly spread. Eventually, a carefully edited two-volume work was published with the full text of Demand's articles. But the seedy revelations had already leaked out. Irreparable damage had been done to literary theory, to deconstruction as a theory, and to Demand's reputation. The full truth slowly emerged. He was also a bigamist <laughs> who for years did not acknowledge his first family or give much support to his children. 
they, they were in, in Belgium and then in Europe. He had been fired from Le Soir for overreaching, had opened a new publishing house in 1946, and used the money he obtained from his private investors for his personal cash. Many lost their life savings, including his former nanny. <coughs> he fled to the United States to avoid prosecution. He was convicted in absentia in Belgium and sentenced to five years in prison. His father never spoke to him again. Demand then cleverly doctored his degree to get into the PhD program at Harvard and eventually obtained a job at Cornell University. In 1966, having attained a solid reputation in academe, he met Jacques Derrida at a John Hopkins symposium. Eventually, he and Derrida became close friends and collaborators. They both admired Martin Heidegger, the German philosopher, please say atheist philosophy existentialism for a more developed discussion of Heidegger's philosophy at atheistscholar.org. Heidegger had been an active and dedicated Nazi, but he was considered a giant of philosophy by many intellectuals. De Man, Derrida, and Miller, by then at Yale, became known as the Yale School of Criticism, and they were the face of theory when interest in it was at its height. Derrida, Harold Bloom, and Jerry he Jeffrey Hartman, all proponents of deconstruction and friends of Paul de Ma were Jews. But when the truth about him surfaced, some of them tried to defend de Ma. Derrida made a rhetorical connection between the attacks made on de Ma with the extermination of the Jews. <laughs> His defense only served to discredit deconstruction's reputation more than de Ma's past work had. Academe had tired of deconstruction, and theory was over. The brief description I have provided about the most serious of Demand's misdeeds does not go into his additional deceptions and malfeasances. The list is too long. He might have been a sociopath. He was surely a man without a normal superego. The nihilism we have seen in postmodern thinkers like Baudrillard was exemplified by Demand. Hartman had earlier written about him that he is a connoisseur of nothingness. Indeed he was. It is easy to conclude that he could do what he did and write as he did because in the end, at the bottom of all the many veneers he assumed, DeMond believed in just that, nothing. <laughs> it is important to keep in mind that most postmodern thinkers were against humanism and all meta narratives. but while they saved their most serious vitriol for what they called the meta-narrative of science, most of them bypassed criti critiquing the meta-narrative of religion. They were indulgent toward religion, and their indulgence was at least partly due to their own stance against reality. Perhaps they did not consider religion an adequate target. Since science had achieved some hegemony over religion by the mid-1970s, did they see science as the most powerful meta-narrative to attack? Mm. Were they envious that science had serious en uh, evidence to back up its claims while theorists and philosophers did not? Be that as it may, we have seen Derrida turn to a kind of negative religion which preoccupied his thinking for the last 10 years of his life. Demand began his university studies with religious mysticism before changing to science. Julie Kristeva and Lisa Regere, two important postmodern thinkers and feminists, stated that women should take up the, the idea of a female god. The scrutiny that postmodern theorists directed against knowledge claims seems to be contradicted by such statements. Did they forget or ignore the fact that the majority of religious believers insist that they know their beliefs are founded on certainties? <clears throat> believers claim their knowledge has come from God or from people inspired by him. Why did postmodernists appear tolerant of such incoherent knowledge claims? In addition, many postmodernists did not critique the idea of God. Yet the notion of a transcendent other is the ultimate false meta-narrative. Why then, since postmodernists claim to wage war on all meta-narratives, were they so gentle toward the most pernicious one of all, religion? The attack on science by some of the most uh, by some of the postmodernists was were rep, was reprehensible and has had some unfortunate repercussions. I mentioned earlier the use cre creationists in the present day have made of the postmodernist criticism of science. Leotard likely used some of Thomas Kuhn's 1962 book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, when he formulated his thinking about science as narrative. But Kuhn's later career was spent as an opponent of attacks on science. His book was an examination into how, how new paradigms in science replace older ones. It was not an attack on the discipline itself. Please see an atheist perspective 
on the War Between Science and Religion, Part 2, at atheistscholar.org for a critique of Kuhn's book and thinking. Kuhn was a consequential critic of the Strong Program. The Strong Program's theory was a favorite with postmodern sociologists. It claimed that science is a discourse of power. Some postmodernists tried to argue that accepted scientific accounts had authority, not because they were the best arguments, but because they had the most powerful backers. Bill Cook states, it is one thing to recognize that science develops within a social context, and quite another to then conclude that this social setting determines the results of the science. This arises principally from a confusion between knowledge and belief. The postmodern critiques of science include claims that are really minor points which virtually no one disputes. Politics, personalities, and social conditions do play a part in the life of science. No discipline exists in a social void, but such an observation is a truism. What is a much more egregious claim of some postmodernists regard to science is that social interests help determine scientific outcomes. There are instances, of course, of fraud. When some scientists cook the results of their research to favor the institutions funding it or from other personal motives. However, most science, or we hope, is conducted strictly <laughs> according to the true scientific method. Such critics of science often fall prey to the passes for fallacy. This term originated with Susan Hawk, the author of the 2003 volume Defending Science Within Reason. <laughs> Hawk is a philosopher scientist. She has exposed the fallacious thinking of postmodernists and other critics of science. Here is a short description of her theory. Religious and other critics of science often begin by saying that many scientific theories have passed for truth but have turned out to be false. The supposed facts underlying such theories they claim have passed for true but only seemed to be rather than actually being true. Their claim about truth and science is, of course, a truism. It is a valid premise if left at that. But then, such persons make a leap of non-logic to a wholly invalid conclusion that because facts on some scientific examples prove not to be true, all notions of facts, sound evidence, and honest inquiry are specious and fallacious. The claim they are leveling against the scientific method is nonsense. But Hawk goes further into the non-logic of the passes for fallacy. She argues that not only does the conclusion not follow from the premise, if the conclusion were true, the premise could not be true either, thus becoming self-defeating. This is the marked logical weakness of the passes for fallacy, while some, which some postmodernists, religious advocates, and others who see science as an enemy choose to ignore. I shall return shortly to postmodernism vis-a-vis -vis science, but I would like to segue briefly to other weaknesses of the theory. Douglas Kellner has put together a number of very salient critiques of postmodern thought, and it is a grateful dependence on his work that I shall commence detailing a few of the many shortcomings of postmodern thinking. Kellner points out that many postmodern theories are vitiated by their inability to clearly differentiate between postmodernism and modernism, and to articulate the rupture in history and society that produces the postmodern condition. It has already been pointed out that those putative new theorists had merely embraced new totalizing concepts to supplant the old meta-narratives, and the substitute theories are too abstract, too simplistic, and overly general. They need to be replaced by social theories that are more complex and multidimensional. Postmodernists were too ready to throw out concepts of grand narratives such as truth, subjectivity, representation, and so on, when what we really need is to reconstruct them. We can take most postmodern critiques into account, but we shall not be able to practice social theory at all by throwing the older thinking completely out. Additionally, there is difficulty with postmodern theory because it tried to discard not only ideas of reference and representation, but reality. Nevertheless, postmodern thinkers continued to claim access to social reality, which they maintained was their ground of reference. There is a lack of coherence in many of the statements postmodern thinkers made about reality. Baudrillard neg negated the concept of reality and representation in contemporary society, then turned around and referenced the real when he wrote about theory. Lyotard seemed to take his prohibitions against totali totalizing narratives seriously, but as noted earlier, ended by producing his own. In his celebration of protein social and cultural conditions reproduced what he termed 
In fact, his celebration of protein, social and cultural conditions reproduced what he termed was the fragmenting of capitalism. But by refusing to privilege specific discourses, he moved in the direction of precluding the development of social theory. Kellner goes on to point out that postmodernism attacks rationality and after criticizing subjectivity, calls for new forms of subjectivity. Foucault alone, prior to his untimely death, called for a reassessment and qualified return to the Enlightenment project and to rationality. He was a principled thinker who was always willing to correct his errors. And I'm so sorry he died because he would have had a chance to do this and it would have been very interesting. But I would now like to return to the subject of postmodernism and science. For some odd reason, most likely a mixture of arrogance, misunderstanding, and envy, many well-known postmodernist theorists were prone to cite science in an attempt to bolster their ideas, even though they were enemies of science. Needless to say, this application of scientific theorems and formulas to social concepts produced howlers of the most embarrassing kind. Not only was the Paul de Moss scandal a major source of damage to uh, postmodernism, especially deconstruction, but in 1989, an intellectual hoax made the philosophy the object of derision and amusement. A physics professor at New York University, Alan Sokol, submitted a paper to social text arguably the most important and prestigious postmodern journal. Here is the sublimely complex title of his article, Transgressing the Boundaries Toward a Transformative Hermeneutics of Quantum Gravity. <laughs> <laughs> the title alone is a work of sly genius on Sokol's part. His article purportedly demonstrated that the laws of science are nothing more than social constructs. As we have seen, statements such as that had become orthodoxy in postmodern thought. So-called then proposed a new type or model of quantum gravity, more in line with feminism, postcolonialism, and relativism. He knew the editors of social text favored such ideas. When the editors of social text perused the article, they became so enthused about its claims that they decided to print it. They did not involve any other academics or specialists to fact check the paper and try to locate errors. The article was included in the spring issue of the journal, but so-called, in a spirit of incredible mischief, <laughs> had made arrangements with another important academic publication, Lingua Franca. On the same day his article appeared in social text, a letter from so-called appeared in Lingua Franca. He exposed the entire article <laughs> he had written as a hoax. He explained that every word he had written about the social relativity of science was complete rubbish. <laughs> Even worse, Sokol announced that he had deliberately included several scientific errors in the article, which had gone unnoticed and uncorrected by social text. Wow. His hoax was most likely precipitated by disgust with postmodern theorists who had overreached with regard to their knowledge of science. The reason egregious errors had been committed which had allowed Sokol's hoax to flip through was in keeping with postmodern scorn for the old-fashioned academic process of verification and search for truth. Postmodern theorists believed such practices were unnecessary because they were nothing but the culturally constructed narratives of late capitalism. But so-called full article demonstrated that when such pro uh, precautions were abandoned, matters could go horribly wrong. Bill Cook states that the editors of social text reacted with dripping venom, resorting to personal attacks and smears. The entire postmodern project was grievously undermined. The so-called hoax and Paul DeMond scandal seriously damaged postmodern claims of academic credibility, and not credibility alone, but postmodern hegemony. Alan Sokol and Jean Brickmull went on to publish a book in 1997 and 1998 called Fashionable Nonsense, Postmodern Intellectuals Abuse of Science. Mm. The authors attacked the incompetent and pretentious use of scientific concept by intellectuals with no background or serious reading in science. In the book, the two scientists tried to derail the claims of postmodern practitioners that modern science was nothing more than a myth a socially constructed paradigm. So-called and Brickmont charged postmodern writers with using scientific terminology without understanding what it meant, with importing 
importing concepts from the natural sciences into social science and the humanities without any comprehensible reason other than pretentiousness and with throwing around technical terms to impress and intimidate others who do not clearly understand their meanings. In short, so Colin Briefmont charged many postmodern intellectuals with exploiting science to lend their theories a veneer of rigor, which in reality they lacked. Here's a quotation from the book about some intellectuals' deceptive stratagems. The authors charged postmodern thinkers with using a group of intellectual practices that can be described as mystifications, deliberately obscure language, confused thinking, and the misuse of scientific concepts. Let me provide a few amusing examples. Lusa Rigore insisted that E equals MC2 is a sexed equation <laughs> because it privileges the speed of light over the speeds that are vitally necessary to us. <laughs> Lacan, the psychoanalyst, drew an analogy between topology and mental illness that in the author's view was not only false but gibberish. Richard Dawkins, the eminent atheist biologist, reviewed so-called Greek Mont's volume. He too dismissed Lacan's incomprehensible statements. He said, we do not need the mathematical expertise of so-called Greek Mont to assure us that the author of this style is a fake. Perhaps he is genuine when he speaks of non-scientific subjects, but a philosopher who is caught equating the erectile organ to the square root of minus one has, for my money, blown his credentials when it comes to things that I don't know anything about. <laughs> Lacan wrote a small book called The Triumph of Religion. As an adult, he was not a religious person, but in the volume he called Roman Catholicism the one true religion. Postmodern thinkers adored making jokes when they wrote or spoke, so it is possible that Lacan was not speaking seriously. He went on to say that Roman Catholicism will continue to excrete meaning to such an extent we will drown in it, thereby <laughs> extinguishing the need for psychoanalysis. Does he equate the meaning offered by the church with excretion? Was he having sarcastic thought? Some critics have taken his remark seriously, but his re intent remains ambiguous. He never explained himself. The Lacan quote is one more example of postmodernism's softness toward religion, which is a myth, and it's a rational attack on science, which is a discipline based on sound evidence. Humanism, unjustly attacked and discarded by postmodernism, is alive and well, as is science, while postmodernism has all but passed away. My opinion is that it earned its demise. Postmodern theorists arrived at some wonderful breakthroughs regarding how cultural constructions are constituted and how they endure. They should have stopped at that point and enlarged on their significant insights. The public damage they inflicted on science endures and the religious claim that science including evolution, is only a narrative. In addition, postmodern claims about the construction of meaning have been egregiously co-opted by powerful politicians. Demagogues claim they create meaning, that there is no significance or reality but what they decree. Concepts about creating meaning have spread to those who attempt to put them to use in reaching unworthy goals. Postmodern's excesses may be laughable and now seem quaint but their lamentable borrowings from science while attacking it at the same time they were borrowing from it were unconscionable. Their mystical and enig enigmatic pronouncements did nothing to help clear the myths of superstition and irrationality from the Western mind. Luckily, they were exposed by scientists, by rational people, and by secularist skepticism. I promise to end this lecture with a reaffirmation of humanism. Here is a statement of the intellectual foundations of humanism as put forth by Mario, Mario Bunhe. There are seven of them. One, cosmological. Whatever exists is either natural or man-made. Two, anthropological. Common features of humanity are more significant than the differences. Three, axiological. There are some basic human values such as well-being, honesty, loyalty, solidarity, fairness, security, peace, and knowledge, and these are worth working, even fighting for. Four, epistemological. It is possible to find out the truth about the world and ourselves with the help of reason, experience, imagination, and criticism. Five, moral. We seek salvation in this world through work and thought. Six, social. Liberty, equality, solidarity, and expertise should be used in the management of the commonwealth. Seven, political. While allowing freedom of 
and from religious worship, we should work toward the attainment or maintenance of a secular state. Note how the writer has begun with the natural sciences and ended with the social sciences. There is a term for his procedure. Bill Cook calls it a system account of humanism which grounds it in reliable information. The procedure would have been attacked by postmodern thinkers as well as the foundational statements about humanism. But there is coherence and solidity to humanist beliefs that were significantly absent from many of the concepts put forth by postmodern gibberish. We thinker, we free thinkers, we free thinkers, by using our reason and common sense, have not only learned to spurn religion's mystifications, but also to reject statements made by intellectuals without sound evidence to support them. We embrace humanism, rationality, and the secular values passed on to us from the Enlightenment. I would like to close with these words by Lewis Carroll's Humpty Dumpty, whom all of the king's horses and all the king's men could not put back together again. He seems to be an amusing exemplar of postmodernism, arrogance, and obfuscation when he makes this unintentionally ironic statement. When I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, <laughs> whether more or less. <laughs> Postmodern indeed, postmodernism indeed, has turned out to mean very much less, and like Humpty Dumpty, has suffered a very great fall. Rest in peace, Pomo. Thank you for your <laughs>